Because you don't have any sort of consistency in your year-by-year trends, that's going to be the biggest question mark. Ask Dr. Gray pre-med Q&A brought to you by Blueprint MCAD. How are you doing today? I'm very well, thank you. Uh, how are you? I am great, thank you very much. What can I help you with? Uh, so today, Dr. Gray, I kind of have an interesting question for you. Um, how do we explain and show our progress to admission committees that our when our upward trends sort of falter? Um, and so for context, I had a tough time adjusting to college my first year and a half. Uh, my freshman and sophomore year science courses are all kind of C's or D's, um, well, one D. And so I received a D plus in Chem 1 and then retook it the next semester and got a C plus. Um, that summer, I took Chem 2 at a local college, uh, got an A. Uh, and then when I came back to school that fall, realized it didn't transfer to my home institution. And so when I retook Gen Chem there, it was much harder and I received a B minus. And so after that semester, um, I continued to take advanced biology courses, physics one, physics two, and had uh, uh, all A's. Uh, up until my first semester of senior year, um, I got a B in Orgo two and a C plus in physics two. Uh, and I'll just give myself some credit here. Uh, chemistry is not my strong suit, but physics, that grade really, that, that hurt a lot. And it was, I think, mostly because I had not done very well on that final exam. So um, I'm really scared about how schools are going to view this fluctuation in my trend. Um, and so I'm wondering how I can even begin to address that in my application and how I can approach this issue. That's a tough one. Let's, let's throw this back on you. How would you try to explain it? That's a great question. So <laughs> I would really just say that at least in the beginning, um, you know, you're 18, you're 19. I I'll take the, I mean, I take full responsibility always. Um, my study habits were not where they should have been. I wasn't focused. Um, but as far as, you know, you know, and as you mature and you get better study skills, you learn more about how you are as a student, what works for you. I mean, I was doing better. And then that C plus in physics, I mean, it was just one bad day. And so for me, the problem for me is like, I don't really know to admissions committees even, would they even give me the time of day? Because would they just see that as an excuse? Or, I mean... Yeah, I, I think it's going to be hard to try to explain away bad grades when your academic career is kind of bookended by poor grades. What are your final numbers? Do you know? Have you calculated yeah. kind of what those numbers look like? Yes. Um, actually, I calculated it on Med School HQ, so from your website, so okay. I trust it. So uh, my final numbers are a 356 cumulative okay. and a 342 BCPM. Okay. And I also have the trends for you if you want to hear them. Sure. Um, sure. So cumulative, uh, freshman year, 327, uh, 348, 393, and then back down to 364 per semester. Okay. Um, and so, uh, and then for science, it started from a 2.3, 324, 393, and then finally 3.6. So the, per semester, right? So yeah. um, it's kind of a little bit all over the place a little bit. So. Yeah. It, it's funny when, when you initially presented this kind of up and down fluctuation, when you actually give me those numbers, they're not super scary. Yeah, it would have been great if your junior year 3.9 would have carried over senior year 3.9 as well. It's it's those C's that really, and it sounds like it doesn't sound like there's a ton of them because your overall GPA is is still relatively decent. Mm -hmm. It's going to be the question mark of which student are we getting, and I, I love the way my my mapped colleague Dr. Scott Wright says is is I don't know what student I'm getting. Am I getting the 2.3 student? Am I getting the 3.9 student? Am I getting the 3.6 student? Or am I getting the 3.2 student? And, and because you don't have any sort of consistency in your year-by-year -year trends, that's going to be the biggest question mark. Who's going to show up first day of medical school? And, and are we confident that it's not going to be the sub-3 student? That's going to be the biggest question mark. And, and really, when you try to explain away something, it will usually just fall on deaf ears because there's, there's nothing that you can say that says, well, here's the reason why. 
because that excuse can carry over into medical school. Well, I failed medical school because here's the reason why. And the only way to actually give confidence to the medical schools is to prove it, is to go take a, a year of post back classes and get back up to that 3.9. Because now you have 3.9, 3.6, 3.9, and now I have confidence that you are around that type of student and your first two years were just growing pains. Sure. Um, and to, to kind of just add more fuel to the fire, I mean, it seems that a lot of my prerequisites I took, you know, as a freshman, as a sophomore, and those are where my grades are really low. And again, like Orgo 2, Physics 2, a B and a C plus, like that's, I know that does not inspire conf confidence in anybody that's going to read my application. I mean, um, and so it seems that the bottom line here is that I probably do have to take additional additional classes, right? I, I don't know if it's right or wrong. I, I think I'm very conservative when it comes to telling students, I'm confident in your application. I think you've done everything that you can do to show your academic capability, to show that you're ready for medical school. I, I'm very conservative in that path. And so for you, I would be conservative here as well and go, show me one more year of getting good grades, you could apply this this cycle or next cycle whenever it is. When, when, actually, let's rewind a little bit, right? As we're recording this, it's late August. Are mm -hmm. you in the current cycle or are you applying next year? I'm applying next year. So I've actually taken um, two, two gap years so far to address deficiency, deficiencies in other parts of my application that was volunteering, clinical experience. And so now I'm like a trial manager for a COVID-19 clinical trial. So okay. I just my GPA and my MCAT is still pending. I plan on taking it in January and I know that can change uh, the trajectory a little bit. Okay. Um, so that's kind of where I'm at. So classes just started, right? So you theoretically could go jump into classes right now, mm -hmm. maybe, and, and do spring, uh, fall and spring of 2022 and apply next cycle with another... 25, 30 credits, depending on how much bandwidth you have to take credits, right? Maybe maybe 24 credits, 12 a semester. Um, you potentially could do that and not delay your application anymore. It would it would require some quick turnaround on your part to, to go jump into classes right now. So I think knowing that you're not applying until next year, knowing that classes are just starting as, as we're recording this, and you potentially could go jump in, and it sounds like maybe you're working full time as this kind of site manager for for um, for some research. Try to find maybe a community college, take some night classes, whatever will work to fit into your schedule. Try to take some of those upper division classes, genetic cell bio type classes that maybe you haven't taken yet. Take those, get as close to a 4.0 as possible, get that upward trend going. And all of that also on top of potentially taking the MCAT January, March, whatever uh, of 2022 as you're planning. Yeah. So I actually had looked into taking additional courses at a local uh, institution near me. And so I graduated with a degree in molecular and cellular biology. So okay. actually the, the amount of advanced courses that I could take at really any any school um, is already pretty limited. Yeah. So do you have any way of uh, kind of addressing that? No, it's it's just going to be kind of cherry picking classes that you can you can figure out without just retaking classes just to retake classes. Yeah. So even though my GPA and because of how many credit hours I do already have, you know, if I do take two or three of these advanced courses that I haven't already taken, so that's not going to move my overall number up very much. Nope, but I don't I don't care about your overall number. Okay. I don't care okay. about your overall number. I care about the trend. Okay. Got it. That's, so, that's the biggest thing. Get get your trend up with a decent amount of credits to continue that trend. Okay. And would you have any recommendations? And I know, um, obviously, I'm trying my best to score as high as I can on the MCAT, but is there like a goal range that I should be aiming for, at least realistically? Yeah. Five, 528. Okay. That, that's that's the goal for everyone. 528. Uh, yeah. Too, too many students try to play this game of like, well, here's my GPA. What MCAT score should I shoot for? And there's just, there's no equation out there. It's it's impossible to give you that range. You can go to the AAMC and look at their historic data. And they do have uh, grid charts that show uh, GPA ranges matched with MCAT ranges and what the 
number of applications were for that that range uh, and number of matriculants or number of acceptees. So you could look at that, but that's prior data that doesn't predict the future. And there's no stories behind those those numbers, right? So on, on that grid chart, it'll say 3.4 or 3.5, but you don't know, is that 3.5 across the board? Is that 3.5 with a downward trend? Is that 3.5 with an upward trend? You don't know with that chart. So I don't, I don't like looking at that chart because it tells me nothing other than this is raw data that, that doesn't tell me anything. Absolutely. Um, and so I have a follow-up question to that. So yeah. what would your recommendations be for maybe if I was looking into, or if somebody suggested to me, hey, take an SMP, um, that, but I mean, would you have any recommendations on whether or not I should do that? I don't think that- you need an SMP. SMPs are super expensive. They're, yeah. they're typically longer mm-hmm. d- depending on what you look at a year or two, depending, uh, on, on which ones you go to an SMP for me doesn't move the needle, especially because it's graduate coursework. And, and I just, I'm a firm believer talking to too many admissions committee members, talking to too many students who have gotten feedback from admissions committees that the undergraduate GPA is the bigger factor in this process. Okay, great. And so let's just say I can't get into any courses or let's just say it doesn't really fit my budget right now to take additional courses and study for the MCAT because I am paying for tutoring and courses and things like that. So If And so obviously there's like kind of an opportunity cost there where I could, you know, I'm giving up one thing for another. And so if I do, let's just say I do apply Mm -hmm. this upcoming, this upcoming cycle, I get a decent MCAT score, but I just, I just couldn't afford time-wise and and money-wise to take additional courses. I mean, do you see that being like really unfavorable? Because I know my GPA, right, it's not the worst out there. Uh, And I, and I'm, I worked really hard for that, for that, for that number. Right. And so is, would that be really a silly decision? I don't think it's silly. Again, I lean towards being conservative when it, when it goes to giving the green light to say, I'm confident in your stats. When I know, especially in your situation, there's more you can do, including taking classes between now and when you're planning on applying. But from a financial perspective, perspective if that's just not in the cards then it's not in the cards and you have to you have to go in knowing that risk of I'm going to apply in 2022 I pray that my MCAT score is just going to blow everything out of the water and it will ease some concerns potentially of medical school admissions committees that I'm academically capable and I'm going to apply at, and I'll be okay the, the consequence of that is you crush the MCAT, medical schools still are unsure of the type of student you're going to be. They're, they're, they maybe won't be concerned about your board scores if they're going to correlate MCAT score with board scores, although step one's pass fail at, at this point for you in the future. Um, but, but they may still be unsure of your GPA and you may not get in because of that. And then you're looking at not knowing that until late 2022 when you've already gotten past the point of taking more classes in the fall of 2022. And now you have a semester, the spring semester of 2023 to take classes before the next cycle starting June of 2023. And so now you only have one semester of classes potentially, or you could just proactively once the MCAT's over, just know during the cycle that you're going to take some more classes in the fall of 2022, getting prepared potentially for needing to reapply in 2023, knowing that your GPA may be the biggest factor. So it's 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 not stupid, it's not silly to apply with what you have now. It's just more risky in my in my mind. Sure. And so some follow-up questions to that is when you say a MCAT score that blows blows things out of the water um what what i mean are we talking about like 520 plus because i mean there's a difference so so you've already asked me this question i said 528 (laughs) okay okay you you can't you can't back you can't backdoor me into giving you an answer that i'm not going to give you an answer to really trying for that um okay but okay understood understood and so Say I, you know, I, I kind of like the idea of maybe just applying this uh, this upcoming cycle, 
but then also just being proactive about things and taking courses. Mm. Um, I, I think I'll have enough money saved up by then to really do that and have more time on my hands. Now that I'm kind of out of the way. And so say I don't get it in, God forbid, and I'm a reapplicant. And I know that comes with its own set of challenges. Nope. Do you mind? Nope. Being a reapplicant does not come with its own set of challenges. Let's bust this myth here and now. Being a reapplicant is not a scarlet letter. It's not a red flag. It's not an issue period. The problem that comes with being a reapplicant is putting a crappy application together the first time and not doing anything to fix it and putting a crappy application together the second time because people don't reflect, don't ask for feedback, and just continue to 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 put together a crappy application and, and apply again and go, oh, I didn't get in again. It must be because I'm a reapplicant. No. Okay, perfect. Um, so those are all the questions that I have. And thank you so much for, um, really telling it as it is. I appreciate that. So, um, but do you have any further advice for anybody, not just me, that would be in a similar situation like I'm in? Yeah. Grades, 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 focus on those grades. I I think it's, it's so important to, to number one, not give up after a, a poor start. Like, like you had, it sounds like, um, not, not hearing what people say out there, whether it's advisors, mentors, physicians, whoever, that say, oh, you're not smart enough. Oh, you'll never get into medical school with a D plus. Uh, I'm, I'm glad you've continued to push through and have turned around your academics. So that's that's wonderful. And I think everyone needs to, to understand that a single grade, a single semester, single year doesn't define your academic capabilities. So... Uh, congratulations for continuing to push through and fingers crossed that you you do well on the MCAT. You, you mentioned having a tutor, taking a course. What what uh, what are you doing MCAT prep wise? Uh, I'm going with Blueprint. So I've decided to take on a tutoring package with Blueprint. Um, okay. I really enjoyed, you know, their materials. Um, I trust them. So yeah. um, I just decided to, uh, I think I start this upcoming week with them anyway. So it's nice. really, really exciting. So what, what was the decision algorithm for you to go with a tutor versus just taking like their live online course? Oh yeah. So um, that's a great question. So actually I started studying uh, because I am working full time. So I started studying in April of this year. I took a, the half lung diagnostic started with a 500. So that was much better than I thought I was going to do. Um, and so I've been studying, um, kind of passively. And then I took a full length, uh, a few weeks ago and I did improve, which was great. I took the full, full length number one from blueprint. And I just thought to myself, I could be doing so much better. And I had heard great things about blueprint. I was already taking their, their exams and liked the analytics that it gave you. So, um, for me, it was just no question. And I had been using some, I, in the past, I've just used other, um, like other big name brands. Um, and I don't really like their approach. Yeah. So. All right. There you have it. Uh, well, good. Uh, obviously I'm a big fan of blueprint. They've, they've, uh, done amazing work to help students crush the MCAT. And I hope you are the next one in line to, uh, to crush the MCAT. So Good luck. Fingers crossed. Uh, I hope it's one and done application and MCAT wise for you. Uh, so f- fingers are crossed on, on our side for you. Of course. Thank you so much for taking the time and having me on here. Um, you do so much for us students. And I just want to say from the bottom of my heart, thank you.